Looks like they're on. Okay. Now we are recording. Uh, so welcome to the Boston Python online lightning talks. Uh, we have six presenters. We're going to go almost in the order that they appear here. Um, I think I'm going to go third in the middle rather than being at the beginning. Um, a few things about Boston Python, especially since we have people who for whom this is their very first Boston Python event, including two of our speakers this afternoon, which is interesting. Um, we uh, have an online presence at about.boston.com, which is a website with all of the information about us, including our code of conduct, which uh, governs all of our interactions, whether online or in person. Um, there's also information here about the events we do, although it's about the in-person events that we're not doing at the moment. Um, it has a link to our Slack, which you should, if you're a Slacky kind of person, you should join our Slack because you can chat with people and get problems solved or help people out or just meet people and chat. Um, by the way, this site about.bostonpython.com is a GitHub pages site. So you can edit this page on GitHub um, and make a change to the page. Um, if you're interested in learning how to do open source collaboration and coding is still uh, a scary part of that, this could be a good, good way to create pull requests and collaborate with people and get a feel for how GitHub works. Um, this afternoon, we are not offering you food, unfortunately, but we still have a little bit of sponsorship in the Zoom channel that we have here, which is courtesy of my employer, which is edX.org, um, online courses, uh, it's a site that's been running for about seven years, founded by Harvard and MIT. We have more than 2,500 courses, apparently, um, including a course by Harvard Medical School about how to use ventilators on COVID-19 patients, which was put together very quickly at the start of this thing and has now been viewed by 50,000 people. So um, we're trying to help the world as we had been by offering education online, but even now we are trying even harder um, our traffic is way up, as you can imagine, and we're trying to put courses in place that will help the world uh, in the moment that we're, we're in. Um, what have I forgotten? I don't know what I've forgotten. Um, this is about the time when I normally say that you should go to PyCon, but PyCon would have happened last weekend. Um, PyCon now has videos online. Um, because it didn't happen in person, they asked the speakers to record themselves, and those videos are going up, and so you should take a look at them. Um, Matt Bachman, our first speaker, is one of those PyCon speakers who put his recording up, um, so you should go see um, what he talked about. The PyCon talk that he did is a completely different topic than what he's going to talk about tonight. Um, so uh, I think that's all we need to say. Um, Let's get started. Matt, are you ready to share your screen? I am. In order to do so, you need to stop sharing yours. OK. Thank you for uh, helping me understand the world. Stop share. All right. And then let me set this up. So in theory, you should all see the slides now. And I'll start, I'll start the timer. Oh, you got Hi. My name is Matt Bachman. I'm here. I'm going to be talking about GraphQL in Python. This is going to be about what it is, why you might want to use it, and how you would set up your server in Python. So first, what is GraphQL? GraphQL is an API query language. The idea being where, unlike REST, where you have multiple different endpoints for your various models, and you can have different endpoints to perform actions on those models, GraphQL presents a single unified endpoint for your entire model and a language with which to query and also make changes to it. And the other thing to understand is that it's not really tied to any particular database or storage engine. So it doesn't matter if you're using Postgres or MySQL or even trying to connect multiple services together. The idea being it's just a separate layer entirely. You can resolve the queries any way you want. Uh, the next thing to understand is that GraphQL is a schema. API. So as you define your API, and a schema can either be written by hand or a schema can be is generated from the code that you're running on the server. This is an example uh, schema. There's some stuff around this, the base schema has queries and mutations. Queries are the ways you select data in the system, and mutations are the way you do anything that involves side effects, so modifying the system or some other types of operations. Um, you can see here, uh, mostly on the right side, these are the various models in the little toy system we've developed. You got users, you have connections or like friends, 
you have posts, and you have uh, you have comments. So essentially, a simple blogging platform is the idea. On the left side here, I just have the queries the system currently supports and the mutations that the system has. In fact, I'm sorry, I should have my spotlight on so you can actually see stuff. There we go. All right, so what's next? So I'm gonna show you some example queries just so you can get a sense of how this works. So over here is from the client side, a GraphQL query. I'm requesting a post, uh, the post, who and all the posts from the author ID of one. And you see here, I select the data I want from the post. We'll, get in, we'll show some more examples, but with the, one of the advantages of GraphQL is you select exactly what you want and you get back that, nothing else. So if I run this query, I get this response back, with the data, the post, and my, my content, and then the comments to that post. So say you're writing a page and then you decide, you know what, I don't actually need comments on this page. That's completely okay. You just remove that from your query and you make a post to the exact same URL and you get back data that's just your content with none of the comments involved. And then say you're looking at your query here and you say, okay, I got the author's name, I can display it, but in my site, I'd like to link back to that author's page. That's fine, just simply add an ID and boom, you have the ID and the author with the ID right there. So just the thing to remember, one endpoint changes to the query affects what you get back. You don't have to play with many, many APIs or make requests out to the server team to make changes. So that's pretty slick. And another cool thing about GraphQL is if you make a mistake, so I put some nonsense in here for something that can't actually be queried, you get back a pretty nice error message saying, I can't query yield some nonsense on a post. And it tells you exactly where in the query the error happened. But there's, there's something, something wrong here. I got a response code of 200, which that's weird, right? So this is the other gotcha of GraphQL. GraphQL throws out a lot of the things you've been used to with REST. And one of the most, the one of the first ones you'll encounter is the fact that response codes are less useful. As long as your server is returning something back, it's probably giving you back a 200. And why throw out status codes? They seem pretty useful. The reason is that GraphQL support it supports making multiple, requesting multiple things in a single request. So this example here, I'm requesting two posts. I, I alias the first one the first, I alias the second one the second, I say two different queries, and I get back the first result up here. And the second result's null. And in order to understand why, I have to look into the errors array, or the errors object, to get back that information. So the idea here, this is like a partially successful request. And I understand, I know there's status codes for that, but the GraphQL just kind of threw out that and said, look, we're supporting getting back very complex responses. The status codes just do not provide enough information to be useful, or at least that's my understanding of what they did. And the reason why you want to support this support, uh, partial response back is if you're building a complex site and you're having a, qu a query that gets you all the information for that single page, you don't necessarily want the entire page to fail just because part of the request failed. With this, you can do a sort of soft, soft failure where certain parts of the page don't render uh, but most of the page still does, allowing for a mostly successful response. So why, why would you consider GraphQL? And the reasons are mostly that you can build an API with an evolving but still typed schema. I really like having a basic typed schema. It acts as nice documentation, and it's nice for uh, supporting clients of various kinds. And also it's really nice that clients can ask for exactly what they want and receive only that. And that means the same same queries can be made on different parts of the app, and you don't have to you don't have to let that response grow to support that, or you have to you don't have to make many many different endpoints to support the various use cases. You just have the one case, and clients can efficiently request what they want. And as you, I gave some hint of GraphQL is just wildly flexible, which is really nice. And one feature I'm not going to get into is the idea of subscriptions. But at a high level, essentially, you can subscribe to to uh, uh, you can subscribe to certain data, which is super helpful for basically maintaining a WebSocket between the client and the server and getting updates to that model or notifications. There are various use cases. I'm not going into detail of that. But GraphQL has a lot of trade-offs as well. So it's strictly more complex. It's just a, uh, for a very simple application, GraphQL is definitely overkill. And even for a moderately complex one, GraphQL can sometimes have some gotchas that can leave you frustrated. Uh, a lot of this complexity in my, this is pure opinion, a lot of this complexity is felt in the back end. So from the front end perspective, you have this super flexible, fancy system. On the back end, you actually have to resolve some of these queries and can get, that can get you into some trouble. 
I, I'll go into some, I'll briefly mention a solution to that later, but anyways. Uh, you're also not able to really leverage the browser built-in caching. Every request is a post to a single endpoint. And if you, HTTP doesn't cache post queries because posts aren't necessarily repeatable like a get is, so you completely throw out the browser's cache, which is not great. Uh, however, there are solutions to this as well. I'll get into that briefly later, but just it's something to keep in mind. Uh, there's also performance gotchas in the back end. You can see, you can imagine a world where I'm making a really complex query. Say I'm selecting a user's post, comments on the post, and say one user commented 100 times. If you, if you try to resolve that query in a naive way, you can end up hitting your database 100 times, getting that exact same user back 100 times. There are also solutions for this, but it is still a gotcha if, you, if you're not aware of the potential. So how do you implement this? Uh, the way I've seen is a library called Graphene in Python. It's server agnostic. I'm gonna use, uh, I'm gonna use Starlet as my server, but it completely works at Flask, Django, whatever you want. Uh, here's the boilerplate for a GraphQL implementation of Starlet. You define your mutations placeholder, you define your queries, you have your schema, and then the routes to the application and then just the app in the main. Flask would look very similar. I don't know how Dan Django would look, but I do not want to try to fit that on a slide. So let's add a query just to show you what that looks like. I define my type, which is a user. I say it has an ID and a name. And then I define the user query, where I essentially say, here are the fields that you can query for. I can query for a user, it's of type user, and the, it takes a param of the user ID. So essentially, I can query users by ID. And then I tell, Gra I tell Graphene how to resolve when someone requests this property, how do I resolve it? And this is this can be nested. I don't I can't get into it too much, but you can imagine user has a complex type inside of it, and it's Graphene has uh, has some nice shortcuts to make it easy to resolve those nested structures. And then once you have your query defined here, you go back to your boilerplate, you add that class as a subclass to your queries object, and suddenly you have the power to make this query of user and give it your name. And then the last thing we get into as far as actual mutation is a, a mutation, the ability to modify data on the system. So I define my create user mutation, and I, say, I give it two, two uh, properties that, are, you, that the server will return when this mutation comes in. You can say, give it a basic OK flag, and then the actual user will be returned by it. And then the method down here is how to actually resolve this mutation, what to do when someone calls this mutation. And then I put that mutation into my boilerplate, and then I have the power to make a mutation. So this is what a GraphQL mutation looks like. I haven't actually shown that yet, but essentially you say, I'm gonna do a create user mutation, call create user, give it the property document, and then give me back the user, but I only really want the ID back. I don't need the name because I already know it. So request the user ID and then give me back the okay flag. And that's essentially it. So I got 30 seconds left, a couple things I didn't have time for. Data loaders are a really important topic. So if you're interested in getting into, if you're interested in trying out GraphQL, you're not gonna get too far without learning about data loaders. What they essentially do is they take your query and they use a promise structure to essentially suss out exactly what queries to a database need to be made and it batches those requests together. So if you request 100 different users, instead of resolving them one at a time, it collects those results and then batches a request to a database in order to minimize that round trip. If you're not using data loaders or you're using them poorly, that's when you get into those really bad performance situations. And it also supports caching. So if you request the same user many, many times, data loaders help you in caching that result. And then the other topic is Apollo or Relay. These are the front end client solutions. So what you'd actually use in your web app. This is the solution to that not using the browser caching. So it handles a lot of the caching around queries and it updates that cache when you make mutations. And then it also integrates with your UI framework. I think React and probably Ember, but I actually haven't tried that. And then it also helps managing WebSockets for the subscriptions I didn't get into. And that is the topic. I'm all done. Great, thank you. Um, one thing to mention is that Graphene, the library, is maintained by some members of, there are members of Boston Python who are maintainers of Graphene. Um, we actually had a presentation night back in September um, at Chewy where uh, about GraphQL from some of the maintainers. And uh, as a result of that, there is a GraphQL channel in the Boston Python Slack workspace. If Ooh, you want I to open that up. <laughs> want to find out more about what's going on there. It hasn't been that active lately. There was a bunch of chatter there after that presentation night. Um, if there are any questions, um, put them in the chat. Um, while you're thinking about a question, I will mention that uh, 
we have six lightning talks tonight and um, they tend towards the expert, um, but anyone can do a lightning talk. We, it doesn't need to be something that you have written, right? Uh, Matt just told us about technology that was not of his own creation. Uh, it's just something that he knows how to use and that he thinks other people would be interested in. Um, but you can also just do a lightning talk about something you just learned. And uh, the first thing people fear when they think of a topic about to do is it's already been done. Don't worry about that. Um, everything has already been done. No one would write anything or write any songs or books or movies if they stopped themselves because it's already been done. We need to hear your take on a topic um, and everyone will be interested to hear it. So if you want to talk about something, please get in touch with me um, and I will help you. Um, Matt has put a link to the slides. I assume those are your slides uh, into yep. the chat. Chris, are you ready to go? Oh wait, well, there's a, a question from James. Matt, what would you say is the thing that makes you reach for GraphQL when designing an API? Uh, I, I think it's best. So I actually work, the company I work for uses GraphQL. I'm not super convinced we were the best use case for it, but essentially if you have, if you're trying to unify several, many different systems in your, in your organization, GraphQL is a pretty good option. And it's also pretty nice if you have model, if you have, if you have data that models pretty well to a graph, it can be pretty well. That's why GraphQL was actually invented by, I believe, it was Facebook. And if you if you have a if you have a data model that uh, loads well to a graph, it's pretty nice because you imagine rendering your friends and then rendering some information about your friends and then or rendering a comment and rendering friends about that comment. That sort of nested structure that easily connects to each other. GraphQL gives some nice properties for it. Great. Uh, yeah. It's also just nice. It's also useful just because it can minimize the number of requests to the server, which can be useful in some some situations. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, fabulous, James. Thanks for the question. Yeah, um, sure. Chris, are you ready to go? Yeah, I'm definitely ready to go. Thanks for having me and letting me do this. Sure. Here we go. Um, my my talk, although uh, it might, I, I don't know if the title is intimidating to anybody. It is not going to be the uh, super expert treatment of it. I'm trying to make it as um, light and entertaining as humanly possible. And there are definitely going to be people with a more in-depth knowledge of it than I have. So um, no, I'm just uh, opening myself up for some ways that I've used some of these techniques at work. And um, uh, yeah, so um, what I'm going to talk about is I'm uh, using Python to um, explore high dimensional data. And um, uh, who I am is I am a data scientist at uh, the Dartmouth Antibody Lab in New Hampshire. And uh, I figured this would be a nice opportunity to meet folks because I'm going to be following my wife down to Boston in about a month, assuming the pandemic allows us to make that move. But, um, this is, I figured, the next best way other than in person to uh, just uh, get a sense of what the community is. And it seems very welcoming so far. So uh, nice to meet you all. Um, so uh, this is going to, so um, what I do in a nutshell up there is um, I, I work with a team of bioengineers who um, try to guide vaccine research, something very relevant right now. And, and there are some folks at, in our lab who are working on COVID-19. But what they do is they generate all of these different kinds of measurements that, and they don't always know, though they might have a sense, which of those measurements are important. But they don't have very many subjects because uh, the kinds of trials they run are very expensive. And so what I do is I go in and I um, use a variety of different techniques to try and help them decide what to focus in on in these data sets that have huge numbers of columns and maybe not so many rows. And so uh, if this isn't the way you've thought about data in terms of dimensions, the nutshell way to think about that is if every row is a subject, then every column is a dimension. and um, you might, uh, I, I picked this data set that I found on Kaggle that I thought was kind of fun. This is, uh, I don't know from what year, but this is the nutritional menu for um, uh, McDonald's restaurant. Um, 
And so if every row describes an item on their menu, then each of the columns is a dimension describing some attribute that that item has. So we got calories, we got saturated fat, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, what we want to do is we want to get as much information out of these dimensions as possible so we can get a sense of how everything is organized. And uh, there are so many different visualization libraries in Python. It is just all over the place. And that's great because you can find a library that focuses in on just about any use case. In this case, I wanted to use Altair, which is a library uh, developed by Jake Vanderplas at Google Research. Uh, I, I think he might have been at the University of Washington when he started developing it. I'm not sure. Uh, don't listen to that part. But it's a great library. And the, um, I, the idea of it is, is that um, hooks into the Vega Lite JavaScript backend, which um, is built off of a grammar of graphics, which explicitly thinks about data in terms of mapping these dimensions to different kinds of visual elements. So it's a very organized way to think about uh, visualizing information. So uh, starting with one dimension, and another thing that Altair does is it makes it very easy to include interactive elements like uh, panning, zooming, tool tips, that kind of thing. And so um, we, you can see uh, that if we just want to look at the distribution of calories in a data set, one dimension looks like this and hover over it. You can already get some information like this huge thing is the 40 piece chicken McNuggets. Uh, I, I wouldn't recommend doing that in one go. It's about a day's worth of calories by itself. Of course, if you want to do that, you really want to use a histogram, but this is just to illustrate the concept that this is what a simple mapping of one dimension is. If you want to map another dimension, two dimensions becomes a scatter plot. And then you can see by sodium, we've, we've divided things into sweet and savory, basically. Like down here, you've got all the desserts, hot chocolate, strawberry shake. Up here, you've got your sausage egg and cheese McGriddles. And so that, that kind of makes sense. Um, if you want to go to three dimensions, and this is using matplotlib, um, uh, you can map things to a Z dimension. And this is mapping sugars to that. But this isn't an especially useful way to do that. Uh, another way to think about mapping dimensions is you can say, all right, I can map a dimension to color instead. And so uh, this is mapping sugar to a gradient. And you can see, yep, all the sweet stuff's down here. You can also map uh, something nominal like a category to uh, a dimension. And that, I think, is maybe a more useful way to do it in this case. You can keep on doing this, uh, mapping different elements to size and to shape. But you keep doing that, and it starts getting messy. I've technically mapped five elements here, sodium to y, calories to x, category to the shape of the marker, uh, sugars to the color, and then total fat to the size. But I don't think that you get a ton of insight out of that. So once you read a certain critical mass in terms of these mappings, you want another way to start dealing with it. And of course, what do you do when you start uh, getting to hundreds of dimensions and you don't know which ones might be useful. And this is very common in life sciences. So this is where dimensionality reduction comes in. Um, the way to think about dimensionality reduction is you, it tries to, it's any method that tries to take you from many dimensions to a smaller number of dimensions while keeping as much information about the entire set of data in those fewer number of dimensions as possible. And the two reasons why you'd want to do this are uh, as a pre-processing step for dealing with multicollinearity. If you've got hundreds of dimensions, a lot of them might be offering the same information. And if they're offering the exact same thing multiple times, if you're trying to um, say which one is making a contribution to a certain kind of outcome, well, the an, an algorithm might decide to just pick one at random and then discard all the others or the coefficient might get divided a bunch of bunch of, against a bunch of them and that's just not useful. Um, if you compress the ones that are similar into one, then that uh, deals with that problem nicely. And the second reason is visualization. As, as we've seen, if, if you get past five, six, you, you can't do it. So the methods to know are PCA, TISNY, and the new kid on the block, which is UMAP. 
Uh, the first one is a linear method and the second two are graph methods. The way to think about PCA is um, you try to find, uh, going from two dimensions to one, you try to find, and, and this, is, this is not mine, I'll post a link to where this came from, but um, if you try and uh, find a line between the two dimensions that um, fixes, maximizes the space between all the points, so each point overall has to go the uh, shortest distance to the, to the line, then you can make that the new axis, you can make that the new feature, and you've kept as much information as possible from two elements and put it into one. And um, then, uh, for example, for, for the breast cancer, Wisconsin Breast Cancer data set from Scikit-Learn, um, uh, this is going from uh, s somewhere in the 30s of features down to two, and you can see that it uh, it's information about tumors. You can get it to benign and malignant fairly nicely. And you also there's also methods for figuring out how much information you have kept from the data set um, in each new feature. And this is a this is a scree plot named after this. The people who came up with it thought that it was cute that this part of the graph kind of looked like this part of a cliff. That's literally where the name comes from. And I'm going to skip forward a little bit because I've done this talk once before, went too long, I'm doing it again. So this um, next, the other two methods are graph-based. Um, at least with PCA, there's some, there's some uh, linear mapping from the old features to the new features. With these, you toss that out completely and you try and come up with a similarity graph in high dimensions that just shows how similar is each point to every other point. And then you take that down to two dimensions or however many dimensions you want to get to and you try to uh, estimate in two dimensions, how can I uh, arrange all the points visually in such a way that I am mimicking um, the relationships I found in the high dimensional space. And um, the tisney has been the state of the art for the past 10 years. Um, it, UMAP is, does this, a similar thing, but it's much, much faster. And the, um, the whereas Tisney um, keeps local structure, UMAP also tries to keep global structure and the hyperparameters are much more intuitive and it's written in Python first. So let's say you have a data set that's images of numbers, uh, 64 features a piece, about uh, 1200 long. If you try and reduce that using PCA, that does okay. You sort of get these clouds of colors, um, but you've lost an awful lot of information. Tisney is able to split that up into these much more delineated clouds, which is great. UMAP can do the same thing, but it's about, it's so much faster. This is another great link. Here's a three-dimensional elephant uh, that has been reduced down to two dimensions using UMAP. Now, um, Tisney can do a similar job, particularly if you tune the perplexity up, but you can see to do as good a job as UMAP will do, this will take two hours and this will take uh, three minutes and 22 seconds. So I would seriously recommend checking out UMAP, which is uh, the baby in the block, two years old, if you're interested. And um, finally to uh, finish up, PCA with the McDonald's data set we had to look at does okay. UMAP, uh, it took all the salty stuff over and put it over here, sweet stuff put it over here, and it identified this nice third cluster, which is all the diet food, which I thought was kind of nice. And uh, this is my dog, Zoe. If you have any questions for me, uh, please toss them in. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to meet you all. All right, thank you, Chris. Um, I, I didn't understand a word you said because I'm not a data person. Um, I've, I've said this many times, I'm going to have to learn this stuff because pretty soon I'm going to get kicked out of my own meetup because everyone wants to talk about data. Um, and I wish I had problems to solve that needed those tools because they look fascinating. Um, so Peter asks, any situations in which you choose Tisney over UMAP? Oh, that's really interesting. The answer is maybe. 
Um, the uh, the Tisney seems to do a little better job in a situation where you have um, data where you have one cluster inside of that is contained entirely inside of another cluster. In, in, in that situation, um, Tisney seems to be able to tease the two apart. UMAP has a tougher time doing that. Uh, if you have that problem with your data, you probably know you have it. Um, but um, I would say if you think that it might be helpful, the simple thing to do would to be uh, to try both methods. Um, UMAP you can probably do regardless of the size of the data set, but TISNI, if you're worried that in order to get a good result, it might take three or four hours, maybe take a random sample of uh, something that feels representative to you and try it uh, on that. Otherwise, I think that UMAP, UMAP uh, certainly in the research areas I know about is quickly overtaking usage. Um, for people who want a Tisney like effect. So um, I'd say, yeah, trying is free, try both. But if you need to save your time, maybe give UMAP a shot first. Great, and David asks, have you looked at topological data analysis for dimensionality reduction? Uh, I have not, but it sounds fantastic. Mm -hmm. I, if, if you have any links to pop in, I, I'd love to check that out. I, I think my wife actually sent me a link about something like that, and I thought, ooh, cool, and then I never clicked the link. So, um, yeah, yeah, please, um, please share. Um, and a good place to share those kinds of things is on the comments of the event page on, on Meetup. Um, we can continue to comment there after the fact. Um, and Brian posts a link to a, a talk about visualization from the creator of Altair from last year's PyCon, how to think about data visualization. Um, and yes, Martin, or on the Slack would be great too. Um, uh, Meetup actually will persist longer than Slack because Slack will uh, clean out old messages after a while. But Slack is great for interactivity. Um, so I will, I'm about to do my talk. One note, I'm, I am having intermittent internet trouble at my house. Um, if you attended last month's presentation night, you'll remember that I disappeared on the second to last slide. Um, if that happens again, I am now much quicker at getting back. So just wait for me. I'll, I'll be there momentarily. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to share. Uh, yes. Uh, here's the talks, uh, which we don't need. So what I'm going to talk about uh, this is actually based on my blog post of last Saturday. Um, the New York Times has uh, puzzles on their site, and one of them is a thing called letterboxed. And the way it works is that you get a square with three letters on each side, and what you have to do is make words. And the rules are that you have to connect letters to another letter that is not on the same side as the one you just had. So for instance, I can make the word store, um, but I cannot make the word stuff, because although there is a U, I can't go from T to U. And the goal is to make a series of words, each of which starts with the same, the last letter of the previous word, and use up all the letters and do it in four words. Um, and I played with this for a while and got tired of doing it myself, so I wrote a program to do it for me. Um, and in particular, what I noticed is when you look at yesterday's answers, yesterday's answers are always two words, even if they say try to do it in six words, it's always two words. And I knew I wasn't going to be able to hit that, but my program would. So let's take a look at how I did it in Python. So I'm using a Jupyter notebook here, but there's no data or graphs or anything. It's just a convenient way to um, show the code that I was using. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we go and find online a list of, quote, all the English words. And we're going to open that up, and we're going to make a set of all of the words in the file and put it into a thing called all words. And if we print how many words we got, we got 45,404 words um, that we are going to use as our dictionary of possibilities. Um, now, one of the things we're gonna wanna do here is take a look at how we're progressing. So 
take a step back. What I'm going to do is I'm going to gradually reduce that set of words as possibilities and then search the set of words for solutions. So what I want to do is I want to be able to see the set of words I've got as I reduce it. So I define a function here called print sum, which takes a nice label and a set of words. It uses iter tools I slice to get just seven of those words. And then it makes a fancy F string that will print out the summary for me. So for instance, if I print sum of my all words, it says that there are 4,504 words. And here is a sampling, phase, puzzler, appleton, brutal, Sanchez, repairs, cognitively, which are just seven random words pulled out of that dictionary. Now to make it apply to the puzzle, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a list of strings, which are the three sides of the square. So we have IUT, SFE, DON, and BHR. And I'm gonna join those sides together and make a set of them to be the complete alphabet that we have available to us. These are the 12 letters that we have for making words. So the first reduction I'm gonna make in the set of words is I'm going to choose only those words that are composed entirely of the 12 letters I have available to me. And the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna use a set comprehension. I'm gonna iterate over all of the words. And for each element of all words, I'm gonna make a set of it, which is a, the set of its letters. And I'm gonna use a set subset comparison. So with sets, Python sets, you can say if one is less than the other. And what that checks is whether the left-hand side is the subset of the right-hand side. So this is checking if all of the words, all of the letters in the word, are contained in my alphabet. And I'm gonna call that words 12 because those are the words that have been made with the 12 letters available to me. And if I print some of those, I can see that now I've reduced down to only 2,300 words, some of which are hushed edited, sternness rib, et, which is not an English word, unsure boss. So that's looking good. Now, the, one of the rules about this puzzle is that adjacent letters in a word have to be from the same, from different sides of the square. The way I'm going to check that is I'm going to make myself a dictionary that maps from the letter onto the side of the square. So if I enumerate the sides, enumerate takes an iterable like my list of strings of what's on the sides and numbers them. So I get I going from zero to three and side is the string IUT or H3, HS4, whatever it was. The dictionary I get called letter side says that I and U and T are all on side zero, S and F and E are all on side one, D, O, N are on side two, and BHR are on side three. And now I can write a function called is possible word. And that's going to tell me for any string, is this a word that could have been made, um, you know, following the rule that you can't join the two letters on the same side. And the way we're going to do that is I'm going to iterate over the adjacent letters in the word. And this is a, I won't call it a trick because I'm not trying to deceive anyone, but it's an advanced non-obvious technique that I can take word and word shifted by one, and I can zip them together to get the consecutive pairs of letters. And I'm showing you down here, I took store and I'm doing this to it where I'm zipping store with store off by one and I get ST and then T-O, and then O-R, and then R-E. And as I iterate over those, I can say if the side that the first letter is on is equal to the side that the second letter is on, then this is not a possible word. So I return false as soon as I find a pair of letters that came from the same side. And if I didn't find any pair like that, then I can return true. So now is possible can tell me that store is a possible word, but stuff is not a possible word. And here's store spelled out on the puzzle. And stuff would be S-T-U, S-T-T-U would be bad. And by the way, F-F is bad. You never get double letters in the answers to these puzzles because they're on the same side. So now that I've got a function that can tell me whether a word is possible according to the rules, I can reduce my words again. And I can say for every word in the words made from my 12 letters, keep it in the set if it's possible. And so now I have a set called possible, which has only 593 words, like hushed, intrude, rib, rerun, et, made the cut, unsure, and bunce. By the way, one of the rules is the words have to be at least three letters. So et should have been taken out at some point. I completely ignored that rule. Now what I want to know is I'm looking for two pairs of wor two words that together have start, end with the same letter and start with the same letter. Um, no, the first word has to end with a letter. The second word starts with that. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect words based on their starting letter. So I'm going to make a dictionary, um, but I'm not going to make a regular dictionary. I'm going to use a default dict. Default dict is in the collections module. Um, it's very convenient because you don't have to do the usual check. Does the key exist? If it doesn't exist, give it and make it an, a list. And if it does exist, append to the list. You can just start appending to keys even though they don't exist yet. So I can make a default dict of list and then say, you know, DD sub A, append one to it, and DD sub A, append two to it, and DD another thing, append three to it, and it will happily collect up my values in a dictionary that it builds along the way. So to make, to, to collect what letter words start with, I'm gonna make a default dict like that. And for every word that is possible, I'm going to use as the key, the first letter of the word, and append the word to that value. So I'm gonna have 12 entries in my dictionary, each of the 12 letters I'm allowed to have, and the values will be all the possible words that start with that letter. Uh, and here I can look, and for every letter in the alphabet, let's print out what we've got. So starting with H, we have 59 words, like hushed, here, hunted, hers, hue, herder, and hosts, and so on and so forth. Uh, and just as a check, if we sum up the length of all of those lists. It should be the same as the length of all of our words, and it is. There were 593 sort of both ways, so we've got a little, there are no tests here except for that, but I made sure I didn't lose something along the way in a default dict. Now, words have to start with the last letter of the previous word. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to make a function here called adjacent pairs, and what it's gonna do is for every word that is possible, Look at the last letter of that word, and then for every word that starts with that last letter, yield to the pair, word one and word two. And so, for instance, we can see that we get hushed and dois, hushed and dieter, hushed and dusted. It's boring because it's all hushed, but I can make a random, I can make a list of all the pairs, print out how many there are, and make a random sample to get a better sense of what I've got. So now I've got 39,000 pairs of words like distort and thirsts and sir and rented. Now the last criterion I need for my solution is that these two words together have to use all 12 letters. And what I'm gonna do there is I'm gonna make a function called solutions, which is for every pair, put the two words together, make a set of the words and see if it's the same set as the alphabet. And if it is, I'm gonna yield those two words. So here I will make a, a list of all the solutions and I can print out how many solutions I got, and then I can print all the solutions. And it found four solutions for today's puzzle. Further disobedient, unfinished debtor, and furnished disobedient, and furnished debtor. So uh, tomorrow I can go and look on the site, and one of those four pairs will be the approved solution from the New York Times. Any questions? By the way, um, one of the tricky things here is that sometimes the fancy, the puzzle uses a fancier word than I had before. Um, I have another set of words here, um, words two, and I can rerun all of my cells. And now you see I have about 10 times as many words. And at the end, I have 287 solutions using all sorts of words that, Hordians, subtrifid, what? I don't know. Anyway, um, any questions? Um, I was not monitoring the Slack here. Um, uh, why strict subset instead of less than or equals? I probably should have used less than or equals. I might be missing, missing some solutions. Um, I doubt there's any word that uses all 12, but there might be, in which case you could have a one, maybe a one word solution. Um, is the trick an idiom? Yeah, that's an idiom. Pairing, uh, zipping over the same thing shifted by one. I could, yeah, let's call it an idiom. Um, I can post the link to the blog post in Slack. The blog post um, is kind of the same thing, um, uh, but presented a little bit differently. The word, everything's named a little bit differently because I, as I was doing it today, I decided on better names. Uh, Let's see. The big O from Brian Rutledge. I don't know, it goes fast enough. I don't have to worry about it. Um, the set function eliminates duplicates, yes. Um, 
because mathematical sets don't have duplicates. So when you say what, what, what letters are in the word, you don't, you don't count the two Fs and stuff as different letters. It's just, it has S and T and U and F. And that's the way mathematical uh, sets work. Um, I think the execution speed of default dict is the same as dict because there's a dict under the hood. I don't really know exactly for sure. Um, but again, it went fast enough and it's just a puzzle. You know. <laughs> Sorry, Michael, I didn't even try it today. My wife also got three words, although I didn't find out what three words she got. And I wondered about going for three word solutions, but then it would just balloon out completely. Um, yeah, anyway. Thank you, that was my lightning talk. Um, and thanks for the questions. I, I especially like the less than or equal to one. Now I'm gonna have to think about less than or equal and what I, what I missed because of that. Um, who is next? Where did we go here? Um, Greg, Greg, are you ready to share? I am ready to share. Okay, I'm I, gonna uh, stop sharing. And this is my this is my talk. So can people see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, so this talk is about me as a as, as a Python learner. Um, so I recently moved to Boston after spending eighteen years in Silicon Valley founding three startups. Um, and my last startup uh, did a whole bunch of web crawling and extraction and stuff using asynchronous Python and all this sort of stuff. Um, but, uh, but now uh, I work for the uh, Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. And if you recall last April, there was this lovely image of a ring around a black hole. Um, and when I saw that, I'm like, oh, neat. That's what I did when I was an undergraduate and a grad student. And maybe it'd be fun to get back to that. And so now I have a job working for them. Um, but this talk is not about that. This talk is about the astronomy Python ecosystem. Um, so. Uh, there's this amazing ecosystem in Python that, that almost everybody uses most of the time. So all that, all the, the black hole images you see, um, all the heavy crunching is, uh, you know, done with the usual C, C++, Fortran, whatever uh, routines, but, but the, the, the orchestration is all done in Python. Um, and there's an, an enormous number of packages and I want to learn how to use them. And so I'm doing some, some side projects. So, uh, so this is the hobby project that I was working on uh, earlier this week. Um, so this is a visualization of uh, all the satellites around the Earth. Um, and I want to build a tool, uh, and it's based on uh, stuff in space. Uh, maybe you're uh, familiar with that, um, which is this god-awful JavaScript thing that takes a database of all the satellites, and it displays stuff, and you can rotate it. And, and what this is showing, uh, all the existing satellites are the, are the white fuzz, and then I've selected out a subset of just the ones that are rel have relatively low orbits and are about to burn in. Um, and as you can see, there's a whole big variety of stuff. And the one that's, that's highlighted uh, with the darker blue line um, is a Chinese upper rocket stage that launched something to medium Earth orbit. Uh, I don't know what. Um, and its perigee is very low, so it's, it's you know, getting close enough to the Earth that it's catching a lot of atmosphere. And so uh, what I would like to compute is, um, for every satellite, an estimate of how long until it it re-enters the atmosphere and stops being in orbit. Simple, right? And so, uh, so, I, so I went and I, I found this library uh, that actually computes this sort of stuff. Um, and I, I was a little nervous because uh, when I looked at it, the, uh, the example uh, that they showed uh, only showed the very beginning of this graph when the satellite decayed only a little bit. Um, and so when you're the first person to do something, it's always super dangerous. And of course, it was uh, dangerous this time too. Um, so uh, basically, if you run for too long, here's what happens with it. Um, so the uh, satellite reaches uh, zero altitude, and then it keeps on going. And the reason is, is because computers do exactly what you tell them to do. And in this case, uh, what, um, the, what the, the code does is it doesn't know anything. It, it knows a lot about the Earth's atmosphere. It knows it has a, a scale height of eight and a half kilometers. And so every time you go eight and a half kilometers farther away, the amount of, of atmosphere gets cut in, in half. Um, but it doesn't know anything about the surface of the Earth. And so when the satellite gets there, it's as if it continues on through the air. And so it's like the Earth was a planet made out of air and, and all kinds of crazy stuff happens. So 
I'm the first person to use this. I get to enhance the, the model that it uses for the way the earth works. No problem, right? So it, it turns out, you know, you look at the source code, right? And it, it turns out that the, the, um, the, the thing that's integrating that orbit that you were seeing showing the satellite plunging down to the Earth's surface and beyond um, is a thing in Scikit that does uh, integrations and it's called Solve IV IVP. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of, of related routines that do this. Um, and it has a, a trick that you can use to stop the integration at a given time because it doesn't make any sense to integrate beyond when the satellite arrives at the Earth's surface. Because when it does that, it, it has this event called that we, uh, called litho breaking, uh, which is when you suddenly slow to zero because you just slammed into the earth or another planet. Um, and um, so, so size kit, kit has a feature you can use. You can pass it a callable thing or a list of callable things um, and it will call them uh, with at every single step of the integration. And, uh, and that routine can give you a, a thumbs up. Yes, please continue or a thumbs down. Please stop. Um, and the way it does this is whether or not the return value is, is greater than zero or zero and less than zero. And it goes and it, it finds exactly where it crosses zero. Um, and so, and, and so I, I use this routine, right? So I've got this event function, right? That's, that's supposed to return a positive number when you're going to continue. And I called it event litho break. And it takes as an argument the, the radius of the Earth, uh, the current time and the position of a satellite, um, and the position of a satellite, of course, is six numbers. Um, and the first three are the X, Y, and Z coordinate. And so, uh, so that's what this does, is it returns the height above the Earth's surface. And you do a partial blah, blah, blah. So this is, this is all the, the fun of this kind of programming, is you, you really get stuck learning about all the basics of Python, because you've, you've got to use this functools partial thing in order to be able to get the radius of the Earth into your litho-breaking function, and et cetera, et cetera. It's kind of a pain, but anyway. So this stuff I understand. I'll get to what I didn't understand in a minute. Um, and so the neat thing is, is, is when you do this, right, uh, I, I, get, I get what I wanted. Um, so what I wanted was I wanted the thing to fall to the Earth's surface, and then I wanted it to stop moving. Um, and so here's my little proof, right? So I started at 230 kilometers uh, altitude, and 49 days later, my satellite has plunged through the atmosphere to hit the Earth's surface, and then it stopped moving. So that's, that, that's a, a, a decent result. The, the, the challenges that I have yet to solve, so everything has an API, and the, the way this API works is that you pass in a vector of times that you're interested in, and it comes and gives you back the positions at all those times. Well, but I didn't compute the position for all the times. I, I used this trick that, that once the thing hit the surface of the Earth, I stopped moving it. So I lie about where it is, and, that, and it's an okay lie. It's stationary on the surface of the Earth. But it's difficult to get back the time that um, the thing hit the Earth, which you often want to know because you don't want to graph the part of the curve that, that's the boring part when it's not moving anymore. And um, so there's a, there's a trick you could use to do that called a lexical closure where my, my event litho-breaking function could actually pass to the outer scope, the time when it stopped moving. But that doesn't work with Jupiter, and I'm not sure why. So I have to figure that out. Um, and and the, the second trick is that, uh, um, that's a wart, is that this, this package, the guy who wrote it is very proud that it works with a huge variety of different Python stuff to speed things up. And one thing that it uses is, is a thing called MyPy, um, and it compiles stuff. And so it's not 100% Python compatible. And so Scikit's trick for stopping the integration is not MyPy compatible. Whoops. So I guess I'll have to figure that out. But uh, yeah, so, so there's my, my little exploration into the, the scientific Python ecosystem uh, where I started from scratch. I looked at the source, I figured stuff out, and it kind of worked in the end, which is, I think, the way most of these things end up happening. So any questions? Uh, I don't see any yet. <laughs> It, it sounds like a grand adventure to move across the country and go back to science after Silicon Valley. So yeah, I, I picked really great timing to do it too. I started on uh, uh, March first, uh, uh, March second, and and so before I left, Silicon Valley was having an outbreak. We had just learned that there was community spread within Silicon Valley, and so when I arrived, I didn't shake anybody's hand. I'm like, I'm from the hot spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now Boston's the hot spot. <laughs> Yeah, well, 
I, so yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, Brian asks, did, when you mentioned MyPy, did you mean PyPy or my, MyPy, the static type checker, or PyPy, the JIT Python? Oh, sorry. I, I, I mean the static type checker. So the static type checker doesn't support this annotation on a function. I see. So that's the incompatibility. Mm -hmm. um, so so I, I described it. Indeed, I, I described what the package did incorrectly. There's, there's a thousand acronyms, and I have yet to, to keep them straight in my head. <laughs> Um, Ed said a bunch of stuff here, but I don't know if it's a question. Or um, yeah, so, so it's, a, it's a suggestion of a different way of doing it. So basically, this thing already has an integral solver that you hand it equations, and it goes off, and it does its thing. Um, and so, and so um, you know, I don't really want to modify what that thing does if I can get it to do what I want, which is to tell me when my satellite crosses zero and then stop. And so the trick I used is compatible with the way the, the integral is computed. And so that's a better solution than doing anything that changes the way the integral is computed. Does that, does that make, I hope that makes sense. You know, I'm, I'm just trying to work with the software as best as I could. All right, so one, so I didn't mention this at the top. Um, when we can all get back face to face, we will go back to our usual cadence of a presentation night every month and a project night every month. And project nights are great because you can sit and collaborate with people. And we often have a table labeled science. Perhaps now we'll have one labeled astronomy. And you can, you and Ed could hunker down over the code and pair program and, and make something happen perhaps. Yeah, actually I would, I would love to do that. Um, so I see there's a couple more questions. Um, so I could stop at any height I wanted. And in fact, it doesn't do any good to, com to compute below 80 kilometers because the thing is plunging straight down at that point. Um, so it's effectively re-entered anyway. Um, I, I can't really tell you if the thing's gonna burn up or not because that's a complicated question. Um, and then finally, did you open a pull request? Um, and uh, so, so indeed, um, I did open a pull request. So there's, there's two pieces to this. First, the code as is, as you notice, it, had, it started with a bug that if you, if you compute for too long, it goes below the surface of the earth. And so the example that's in the, in the, the uh, documentation is also the test. And it's only the very beginning of, of evolving the satellite for one day at 250 kilometers. And it's actually falling linearly. There's no second order effects yet. And so that example doesn't really test the code very well. So the first thing I did was I checked in a fix for the test. Because it actually, it also had the even that linear test had the wrong units, and so that pull request was immediately accepted. And then I made a second pull request that added in this litho breaking event. But because I need to discuss the API, it's not a quick thing to get accepted. But the guy who owns the code is who is he, he's a, a data scientist who used to be an astronomer, so kind of like me, um, was very enthusiastic about having anybody interested in this code for the, this particular corner of this code for the first time. So he's super excited about it and it's happy to work with me. And so I have been. Fantastic. That's great, a good open source success story. And yeah. David wants to know, when does the Chinese booster re-enter the atmosphere? When should we be- I actually concerned? don't have the estimate for that particular booster. I just know that it's relatively low. And there's a whole community of people who compute this stuff because they're super interested in where things are gonna re-enter. Sure, um, of and, and, and so, uh, and, and so, but they publish papers about it, but they don't publish code and so i think this is going to be the first time that you'll be able to actually uh, easily do these computations that are described in papers without having to be an expert who's got your own grungy fortran program great i'm i'm personally very interested in the the ongoing maturation of the scientific coding community and would love to hear more stories about open source working and people publishing code and caring about their tests and all that sort of stuff so yeah yeah so the uh, so in, in particular, the, the, the science people that I work for, they do publish all their code. And it's a collaboration which involves 350 people, of which 200 are faculty. Um, and, and so we are a super open organization, and everything is, is public. Um, mm -hmm. And I really like working in that, in, in, in that kind of environment because it, you know, it is, it's the right way to do it. Right. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Joe, are you ready to go? I think so. Can you hear me? One thing, one thing we don't do on the online events is bio breaks, and I'm not sure why. We're all still the same biological creatures. I hadn't thought of that. We'll have to, have to do that better next time. Testing.
Can you I hear can me? hear you, but you're very quiet, Joe. I'll turn it up. Say something. Okay, is this better? Much better. Okay. Uh, so, Greg, you have to unshare. Windows and Linux disagree on what the hardware level for my microphone should be. Who knew? Okay. Can people see the slides? Yeah. This is the first time I've used yeah. Zoom. This is great. You're doing great. Okay. Cool. So, today I'm going to talk about an approach to testing numeric functions. So, I was inspired by Ned's comment on the, the Google Docs sheet. Um, so to begin, we needed a function to test. By the, by the way, that wasn't my comment. That was a question, and I don't know who put it there, but good. Oh, oh. well, great. So whoever asked this, maybe this will help. Maybe it won't help. Um, we'll find out. Do it. Um, so before we can write any tests, we need to have a function to test. So we're going to write tests for this function called sharp ratio. Sharp ratio is an approximate measure for how good an investment is. Generally speaking, an investment with higher returns has a higher sharp ratio and an investment that is riskier has a lower sharp ratio. Uh, the actual like, textbook definition for sharp ratio is that it is the expected value of the returns of your investment or portfolio minus the risk-free rate, all divided by the standard deviation of the returns minus the risk-free rate. The R here are the returns of, that you got, so that's gonna be a time series or an array. Uh, the risk-free rate can be either a scalar, like zero, or some fixed amount, or also a time series. So some people believe that you might be have a risk-free investment opportunity, for example, buying a treasury bill or putting money in a savings account. So you would say, oh, I have a 2% risk-free rate, and I'm going to discount all of my returns by that. Other people think there is no you know, riskless money, so they would set the risk-free rate to zero. Uh, for the rest of this, it won't really matter. And then the term for that R minus RF is the risk adjusted returns. So we're gonna wanna implement this in Python. Uh, to do that, we're gonna use the NumPy package. So we write our function sharp ratio, takes returns and the risk free rate. Uh, and we're gonna implement mostly kind of how this formula is written. We're gonna make a few changes. So we're gonna capture the risk adjusted returns and only compute this once. We're gonna take the mean of that to get the expected value. We're gonna take the standard deviation with a DDOF of one to get the sample standard deviation as opposed to the population standard deviation. Then we're gonna divide these. Um, so I believe this function is written correctly. I'm not trying to like sneak any bugs in here to trick anyone, um, but we wanna make sure that that's the case. So we need to write some tests. Um, so there's generally speaking, I think three kinds of tests that we can write for these. First kind of test is an answer key. Next kind of test is a re-implementation. And the last is a property-based test. And I'm gonna show an example of each of these and discuss kind of what they're, the pros and cons of are doing all of these. So probably seen this kind of test before. We're going to hard code out some input. Uh, these returns are Zoom over the last week. I uh, figured it was a reasonable company to pick. Um, and now I'm just gonna set what the expected sharp ratio is for these three days of returns. I'm gonna compute it. I'm gonna assert that I get exactly this answer. So one problem with this is that um, I have no sense of why should this be the expected sharp ratio for these returns. So I know that you know, if this test passes, this is what our sharp ratio function returns, but I don't know why. Uh, another issue is that we're using inexact equals here. So we've got a floating point number with a lot of precision. We've got all these decimal places out here. We've got a bunch of precision in this input, hard to know whether we actually need the answer to be that precise. Uh, one slight improvement we can make is we can use NumPy's assert almost equal to test that the answer that we get from our sharp ratio function actually matches this expected value within some tolerance. Um, so summary of an answer key type test is that it ensures the behavior doesn't change from exactly what you have now. Um, any minor tweak will cause that test to fail, but won't, um, necessarily um, tell us whether that's actually the right answer in the first place. Uh, these types of tests can alert people that you depend on the exact behavior that you have now. So maybe some part of your program really depends on this exact behavior, even if it's not necessarily um, the most correct. Um, 
And then one failure mode of these answer key tests that I see very frequently is that the tests are tautologically correct because what people will do is they will write the function, they will generate some input, and then call the function that they want to test to produce the expected output. So now all you've, all you've done is say that if I call the function two times, I get the same answer, which for most numeric functions is going to be true, uh, which is fine if you just want to test that the function doesn't change, but um, not necessarily helping you know that you've implemented it correctly the first time. Um, so another kind of test is a re-implementation test. In this, case, in this type of test, we're going to rewrite the sharp function a second time, and then we want to test that calling sharp with the original sharp and our re-implementation produce the same answer. So here we've got sharp two, which does basically the same thing as the original sharp, but it does it slightly differently. Um, notably, we're not going to um, save the risk adjusted returns. We're going to recompute this twice. We're going to take the square root of the variance instead of uh, taking the standard deviation. Uh, in general, when you're trying to write a re-implementation test, you want to throw away all of your performance optimizations uh, in exchange for clarity. So looking at this code as it's written might be easier to compare to the textbook definition because this code just matches up more closely with how it was written down uh, in math notation. So maybe it will be more apparent to a reader that this function is correct, even if they can't see why the original function is correct. Um, and now all we do is call, we generate some input, call our original function, call our re-implementation, and assert that they're almost equal. Once we have this re-implementation, we can actually uh, expand on how we test our original function. And one way to do that is by generating a bunch of random inputs. So this is a fixture that I've found somewhat helpful. Um, when generating random inputs, it is good to always use seeded random. One thing that's very frustrating is if you run a test and it fails, you would like to be able to rerun the test to analyze the state of the program. But if you're using unseeded random, the next time you run that test, it might not fail or it might produce different answers. You can't actually go back and understand why it failed. So we want to use um, random states, uh, NumPy random, random state to generate random numbers. Um, but we also maybe want to try a bunch of different random numbers at the same time. So in this case, this fixture, any test that uses it, is going to be run 32 times with 32 different random number generators. So now we can rewrite our test re-implementation to take this multi-rand fixture. And now we're just going to scan five samples of mean from negative 1 to 1, five samples from, of standard deviation from 0 0.01 to 1, and all using this multiple random numbers. Um, so this test is going to end up running a lot of times, like 5 times 5 times 32 because it's the cross product of all these combinations. And now instead of using some hard-coded input, we're just going to generate um, 500 samples out of a normal distribution with the mean and standard deviation. The reason that we can write a test like this is that we don't actually care what the answer for any particular call to sharp is. We just know that this, no this formula looks a lot more like the textbook one. We're pretty sure this is correct. So for any input that we get, even randomly generated ones, as long as it produces the same answer as this easily verifiable function, we're confident in our, um, in our, our original function. Um, so in summary, we're going to write the function a uh, second time in a different way. And it really should be a different way. If you just write the same code twice, you haven't really re-implemented anything. Um, when re-implementing your function, throw away all performance optimizations and exchange them for clarity. The goal is to be able to see that second function and have it be a, like obviously correct. Um, I'm not necessarily sure that's true in my case, um, but that, that is the, the goal. Um, and once you have this, you can test a large set of inputs or um, some more or just random inputs. Um, also, I found that in writing a function a second time and usually throwing away optimizations, you as an author get more of an understanding of what the function is supposed to do. And you maybe will be able to write more um, uh, targeted answer key tests that help exercise nuanced behavior in the function. Uh, and finally, uh, there are property tests. And these are the kinds of tests that I think actually help us understand whether the function is written correctly or not. So in this case, um, this is the formula again. We can look uh, at. So using this formula, we can try to decompose it into a few properties. So what happens if the mean return changes, but nothing else changes? 
what happens if the standard deviation of the risk adjusted return changes, but nothing else changes? And maybe what happens if the risk free rate changes? So if we know that the denominator has to be greater than zero because it's a standard deviation, then if that's greater than zero, if A is less than B, so if the mean return is less than some other mean return, then the Sharpe ratio must be less than that other Sharpe ratio. So we can write a test where we're going to attempt to model that this property of Sharpe ratio. So here we're going to fix all of the variables that we don't want to change, and we're only going to define them once. So standard deviation is one, risk-free rate zero, and size is 500. We're going to define A mean uh, to be zero, and then we're going to define B mean in terms of A mean so that we know that no matter what the mean of A is, the mean of B is going to be greater. And I think it's actually important to write this as A mean plus one instead of just one, because we've now conveyed our intent to any reader of this test that B mean must be greater than A mean, or it must be defined in terms of it. Um, hopefully, it's, if you just see zero and one, it's less clear that those two numbers are linked. We're then going to generate some random numbers. And again, this test is going to run 32 times. So we're going to get 32 samples where the mean of B is greater than the mean of A. And it should. Um, and then we're going to call the Sharpe ratio on A and B. And for any of these random inputs, the Sharpe of A must be less than the Sharpe of B, because we're trying to tease that property out. Um, the other type of thing we could do here is, is run the same thing with the standard deviation. So we're going to set the mean to zero, risk-free rate to zero, size to 500, just like before. Generate, um, so A standard deviation is one. Now we're going to define the B standard deviation to be always less than A standard deviation. So if we make the denominator smaller, the result should go up and get bigger. So this property should still hold that the sharp of A is less than the sharp of B. Now, uh, there's actually a mistake in how this test is written, and I left it because I was trying to write examples for this talk, and I actually wrote this bug. Um, and oh, my slides are still in the wrong order. Anyway, what we right now we still have the mean as zero, but if we look at the formula, if the mean is zero, we end up with approximately zero over something. And the issue is we're only drawing 500 samples out of this this random uh, normal distribution, so the true mean of A and the true mean of B will not both be zero. They're actually going to be some noise based on just drawing 500 samples. And what was happening was we had, I was testing that two numbers very close to zero were greater than or less than each other. And I was not actually holding that property um, for any two random samples of, five, of only size 500. Um, so in this case, I said, well, let's just make the mean a uh, little bit more than zero so that we can make sure that that important property still holds. So um, goal of property test is to isolate a smaller behavior from a larger function. Um, this helps you as an author like understand maybe more intuitively what the purpose of the function is or how that function behaves. Um, however, they're very hard to write correctly. I, I, wrote a, I made a mistake writing a test, even trying to produce examples for this. Um, and there's probably hard to apply to all kinds of code. I'm not sure necessarily how to tease out these smaller observable behaviors, maybe from some kind of database update or like, did I get my transactions correctly? I'm not sure how you would, how you would necessarily um, do that. Uh, it's also hard to figure out, you know, what are the behaviors you would like to isolate? Um, yeah, so in summary, I would say all three of these types of tests are useful and important and probably want to have a few of each. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Joe. Um, uh, we have a little bit of uh, Finance 101 in the chat. Um, would your mean equals zero test bug suggest a different property test that might be more appropriate? It seems like a property-based approach helps you discover your edges, particularly when it fails. Yeah. So the issue here is that if the mean was actually zero, we would expect that property to be true. Um, but if you only draw 500 numbers out, and I was only drawing 500 numbers to make this test run quickly, then what would end up happening is that in some cases, the mean of B would actually be greater than the mean of A. Like there's going to be, if you just take, you know, two samples from a standard deviation or a normal distribution of size with a mean of zero, you wouldn't assume that the, the mean of that's, those two samples would be zero. If you do it out to 500, it's, it's likely that they're close to zero, but they're not going to be exactly zero. So um, 
if you're only generating a small number of samples where 500 is still reasonably small, the, the means are still changing a little bit, even though you're only, you, you want them to be fixed. So um, maybe you could generate your return series in a better way to ensure that they have the exact same mean. Like maybe you could not just sample from a normal distribution with a mean of zero, but you could define the inputs in a way that forces the mean of the input to be zero. Um, for the question, are there hidden bounds in assert almost equal? Assert almost equal has two parameters. One's like an absolute tolerance and a relative tolerance. I've found that NumPy's has set good defaults for both of these that capture any kind of small like numeric precision issues, um, but doesn't have two like semantically distinct values produce different answers. You can always tweak them. Maybe if you know that you're going to get a bunch of very, very small numbers you need and you care about that, you know that a lot of precision is important, you can set smaller tolerances. But um, I would say start with the defaults. They work quite well. Um, the last question is, what is a fixture, which is perhaps the larger thing we, than we can answer quickly? Um, it's a, it's a, a feature of PyTest that lets you define some code that can be pulled into tests in a very simple declarative way, just the way Joe used the name multi-rand as the argument to his test there that automatically runs the multi-rand fixture uh, before the test starts so that you can commonize the uh, setup of data or some other aspect of your tests. Oh, and thank you, James. There's a link to uh, the slides that I've used in our February presentation night, which was all about PyTest. Uh, Brian, are you, are you ready Hi. to uh, get yeah. started? Let me, um, let's see, this is my... How do I do that? Huh? Hold on. There you go. Okay. Brian, you can share. Okay, okay I'm gonna do that now. Oops. Uh, uh oh, apparently I haven't shared my screen with Zoom before. Uh oh. And do you have a second let's... screen? Uh, can you all see my screen? Not yet. Uh, one second. I'm sorry. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yes. It's Catalina awesome. backdrop. Can you see Visual Studio Code? Oh, and a Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, on the right here, I pulled this up. If anybody's curious, this is uh, um, Hypothesis, which is a proper is, is a Python library for property-based testing that I was I've always wanted to play with, but haven't gotten around to yet. Right. And um, while we're on the topic, our first speaker, Matt Bachman, did a talk at PyCon two, three years ago about Hypothesis and how to get started with it. Yeah, roughly three years ago. Yeah. Actually, oh yeah, 2016. Yeah. Nice. Oh, four years ago. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, Sweet. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so, um, Brian, you might need to make text a little bit bigger for people. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering about that. It, it's um, my eyes are old. Okay. How is that? That's good. Um, Let's go with that. Good. All right. Um, let me. So this is um, uh, the. F this is not rehearsed. Uh, this is a last minute kind of idea that I had. Um, based on a thing that I've been kind of geeking out on recently as a distraction from uh, the world around. Um, I uh, am a maintainer, and over the last year, become a maintainer of the Twine library or the Twine command for uploading packages to PyPI, and um, have been working on adding type annotations to the code base. Um, and uh, I've come up with a process um, for doing that that has worked out pretty well for me, and I thought I um, would attempt to uh, live code an example of it, um, this being the first time I've ever attempted such a thing and I haven't rehearsed it. So um, anyone can do a lightning talk. Um, Woo -hoo. <laughs> um, uh, right, so um, what I'm gonna do here is I've got the code up for the twine check command. Um, it doesn't really matter what that does, but if we sort of scan through it, you can see that there are no um, type annotations um, to it at all. Um, what I have over here on the right is the issue on, that is open on the Twine repo um, that includes a comment that I posted this morning about um, kind of how we get to um, finishing this up. Um, and then down at, and there's, I'll, I'll link this in um, 
the chat or on Meetup because um, there's, I think, some nice handy references in here, including a cool talk from this year's PyCon um, from Dustin Ingram, who's also one of the maintainers of Twine. Um, but uh, in short, um, Twine has pretty decent test coverage. So we can use a tool called monkey type, um, which I believe came from the Facebook or Instagram folks. And basically what it will do is it will run your test suite. Uh, you can use it um, to run your test suite and it will infer type annotations um, from, the, from the execution of your code uh, via your test suite. Um, and uh, I've wrapped that up in talks, which is, uh, and here I'm just using as a, as a way to manage the virtual environment for monkey type. Um, uh, but what that ends up looking like is if I run talk slash e monkey type, it will, um, it will create the talks environment, one moment. And then you can see here, it's gonna run PyTest. So it's gonna run all of the um, Twine tests. And then, um, and that's really all it does. It doesn't give you a whole lot of output. Um, if we list out the modules that it found, then we uh, will see that it gives, um, so these are all of the type information that it found, all of the Python modules that it found type information for while running our tests. Um, it um, it uh, stores it in a um, SQLite database, which if I have a few minutes at the end, we can take a look at that, but I'm gonna skip that for now. Um, so once that's done, the next step is um, to uh, apply those, um, apply the, the, the inferences that it made to, the, to one of our modules. So the one that I'm gonna do is this twine.check module. And um, it's gonna run that, um, moment. Um, no, for what it's worth, normally I would probably be running these sort of ad hoc, but are running these. Um, uh, did that do what I? No traces found for twine.check. Oh, that's right, because it's not twine.check, it's twine.commands.check. Um, normally I would probably be running monkey type directly, but I put this together so that other folks could run it um, more easily, other contributors could run it. So, um, so if we now start scrolling through this, we'll start seeing things like, hey, there are some type annotations and um, uh, there's some more over there and oh, wow, that looks pretty hairy. Um, but this is all of the information. And if we take a look at the diff, um, we can take, get a closer look at what actually happened. So it imported some things um, that it needs. It added some type annotation. It added all these annotations for us. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, did a whole bunch of stuff. Was, although I don't, what is stub? That's weird. I'm not, we're not sure where that came from. Um, one thing we're gonna wanna do right away though is make sure that this conforms to our formatting. Um, in particular, you can notice like the, uh, um, uh, these are all sort of out of order um, with, uh, the regular sort order and Twine uses um, iSort and black for auto formatting. Um, so if I run the format um, uh, commands, it should. Um, ah, yeah, there we go, cool. Um, so now all of our imports are uh, in a much better spot and um, our, uh, oh yeah, this is, this is nice because remember this line was like all like one really long line and now it's, now it's been blackfied, so it's a little more readable. Um, and uh, I can say when I first started doing this, we did not have auto formatting. And um, that was a big motivation for me to um, add the black formatter to our code base was so that this process would be easier. So um, now I'm going to uh, follow my git commit uh, recommendation, which is to apply monkey type, monkey type to twine.commands.check. Um, and I always kind of do that because in general, like I think it's a good idea to do, do the, the automatic stuff first and then do the manual cleanups later. Um, and so now the follow-ups are kind of looking at, all right, what, what's left over? What, what's kind of still messy from all of this? And so there's some things here that are, um, and 
actually interesting. I'm not seeing, oh, there we go. Um, VS Code is integrated with um, our linter and MyPy. So it's actually telling us that in spite of all that, um, we've got some errors. And um, in particular, um, saying, all right, argument one to parse header has incompatible type union string sequence. I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, there's a number of things. Um, oh, okay, right. Yeah, so at this point, the, my process has been like, okay, some of this is gonna be noise from running the tests. Um, some of these are going to be the tests not providing complete information about the types that are involved in all of these various calls. So I'm gonna to need to go through and fix those. Um, um, this one though is an easy one to fix um, because I've seen it before. And in particular, um, it's saying that incompatible types and assignment expression has type namespace, variable has type list, list of stir. Um, that's because um, even though this is perfectly valid Python, we're reassigning the output of parser.parse args. And this is in fact what the parse, the arg parse documentation recommends. Um, because we've already declared that um, thing as a list up top, um, it really doesn't like that. So the solution here is actually really simple. We just say parse args, uh, sorry, parsed args. We give it a new variable. We fix that and we're gonna fix that. And that'll actually um, fix both of these errors now um, because this is now the right type. Um, and here's VS Code being helpful. It's telling me that that is in fact a um, arg parse namespace. And that resolved that error too, because this is an attribute on um, namespace. Um, another thing that's interesting here is um, this stub thing. Um, this is saying it's a returning a object of type stub. Well, what is a stub? Well, if we go back into the top here, um, it's uh, a stub is this thing from the pretend library. This is a, so pretend is a library for, um, making really simple um, stubs for writing tests. So it's an alternative to the mock library. And um, to get an idea of what that looks like, um, we can look, uh, um, oh, and actually, so here's the, here's the function that um, uh, actually runs the, um, that main function. So we can see we're creating the stub. Um, it looks like, I haven't actually really looked at this test before. Um, it looks like we're creating the stub we're saying um, we, we're using a feature apparently called call recorder. Um, and we're asserting that when we're all done um, that it uh, called this function. Um, I'm gonna have to spend a little more time on this one. I'm not sure why this is happening, um, um, but as a, that's an example of something that, you know, have to figure that out. Um, Clean, clean that kind of thing up later. Another thing I'm gonna have to clean up is probably this like giant union of stuff. Um, it probably doesn't need to be complex. This is kind of one of my warnings over here. There's like kind of a lot of complex unions that are probably, they, there's probably like a more succinct way to express this. Um, um, but there's also another level of um, typing that I wanna add, which is the ultimate goal here is to make it past the MyPy strict typing. Um, so at the moment, I've got a whitelist of um, uh, modules that, pa that um, should be passing strict. And I'm going to save that. And OK, now we've got a few more errors here because, um, oh, here's one. Uh, function is missing a type annotation. Oh, huh. uh, this is a. That's interesting. This is an internal, this is a uh, nest, yeah, an internal method um, that just wasn't annotated. So I'm gonna have to kind of determine the type annotations for this one. Um, so clearly there's a little more work to do, but I didn't have to do all of this other work. I didn't have to like suss out. I didn't have to trace through code to find out what um, all of these types were. And I've actually, I found it to be um, uh, incredibly useful in this process. Um, um, Automated tooling has really helped. Um, another kind of useful feature over here, um, MyPy has options to generate its coverage, co co generate coverage reports and generate HTML pi outputs, much like the um, um, uh, coverage.py. Um, so like if we look at, um, and so here's the coverage, uh, the type coverage report of uh, the check 
um, module at the moment. Um, before I did, did this, this was like all red. So there's a lot of, there's a lot more type coverage in here. Um, so that's nice to see. Um, and I could stop there, I guess, if, unless there are questions. Um, I'm happy to show off more stuff. I'm happy to show the SQL thing if anybody's curious, but um, I'll wrap up there. Thank, thank you, Brian. Uh, and I, I appreciate the call out to anyone can do a lightning talk. It doesn't have to be formal. It doesn't have to be polished. Um, you know, showing you're sharing something with a bunch of people. It happens to be a lot of people, but that's okay. They want to hear what you have to say. Um, Srini is saying, just trying to get a sense on type checking. How many people are doing it on their code base? Brian, how many people are doing it on their code base? Uh, it depends. If, it depends what you ask. Uh, not enough is it would be one answer to that. Um, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I guess for what it's worth, um, I found it useful um, in the context of Twine as a new contributor and as a new maintainer um, to take this task on as a way to learn the code base. Um, so going from a legacy, going from a kind of a legacy or existing code base and um, this process has taught me a lot about just the architecture um, of Twine. I'm also um, focusing on it because it strikes me as something that will help subsequent contributors um, uh, understand the code base. Um, and in particular, there's some discussion of adding some, uh, and finally, there's some discussion of adding some new features um, to Twine. And I think this will help in that process. Um, mm -hmm. I've also, it's fun to use on personal projects, um, but I've never, I haven't, I haven't lived with it in a large code base, uh, in a large, like, you know, um, enterprisey or kind of business type code, uh, code base yet. Uh, J James says the monkey type seems cool, but modifying every signature seems a little scary. It could obscure a function semantics. Do you often use it in this mode instead of handling signature annotations individually? And how, how does the safety relate to the exhaustiveness of the test suite? Um, how does the safety relate to the, right. Well, so this is not modifying the signatures, the function signatures. Um, important thing about type annotations is they have no runtime impact. Um, so this is, um, I, I think I'm going to say something accurate, um, which is that, or I believe, Effectively, the 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 the, uh, the resulting code that is run, um, like the abstract and syntax tree, or however you want to interpret that, I'm a little out of my, I'm stepping a little out of my wheelhouse here, um, is the same. So, like all of these type checks get ignored. So, this check file thing, as far as like runtime Python is concerned, the signature is exactly the same as it was before. Um, um, so, it's really for human slash type checker consumption um, that these are these are present. Um, and I believe the other question was around um, using monkey type versus applying them by hand. Um, um, I think this has taken me less time and to um, to sort out uh, and to, to get to good type coverage than if I had attempted as someone who's unfamiliar with the code base to, um, to do this all by hand. Um, mm -hmm. I, think do, I think doing it by hand sort of incrementally is a, is a much more, um, I mean, it is, I think it's just a much more incremental process. Um, and yeah. Uh, so yeah. James, he's, he clarified that it's actually something you alluded to earlier, which is that what the, what the monkey type observes in the tests might just be a subset of what's actually possible with the code. And so right. the signatures automatically applied could be unnecessarily limiting. Um, that's true. Um, I guess one example of that, for one example that I've run into of that is um, um, like, for example, we'll see, I don't know if there's any examples in this file. Um, oh yeah, well, here's an example. Um, you know, it'll do this a lot. Like you're, we're passing lists of strings as type annotations. Um, there's an argument to be made for that this should probably actually be something like iterable. Like, do I really care that that's a list or is it just an iterable? Can it should just be an right. iterable? Um, so it is limiting in that way. Um, 
though again, it's, I think it's easier to make things more liberal as you go. And I think the thing that I found is also the type checker is there. Like I'm, I'm running my pie on this. When there are errors, um, I can figure out how best to resolve them. Um, mm -hmm. And that could be, that could be making it more general. It could be um, making something optional um, that because the, the thing, because of the test, it only saw, um, it assumed it would couldn't be optional, um, right. but uh, I have found that running my pie um, will catch the things that um, the tests didn't catch. Mm -hmm. so. Srini, Srini asks something related to that, which is, do we lose out on duck typing? Like, um, kind of, it, it's right. It's something I think this is getting more into the theory of of type of typing of um, static typing in Python, and for that, I might defer to some of the talks um, that have been given around this. Um, um, you know, you can, um, MyPy does allow um, for, um, so I guess just for example, like, you know, def uh, do something with a, uh, with X where X is a list of stir um, and it's gonna return um, an int, right? Um, um, that's one way to do write this. The other thing is though, um, you could say, well, actually I want this to be an iterable. Um, and that means like that's, so now I can pass in a tuple. I could pass in, um, uh, or I could say an iterable of any, like I don't really even care what this is. So my pi, um, the, the Python specifications for type annotations and the type checkers that exist, of which MyPy is only one of them, but also kind of the most commonly used, my understanding, um, provide support for um, Python's duck typing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And lastly, Joe makes an observation that although the, the annotations don't do anything at runtime, they are actually imported and evaluated, and the Im adding imports might slow down the startup speed of your program, which is especially important for command line programs like Twine. So I, okay, I need to look into this because that was, all right, I, that's, thank you, Joe, for mentioning that. Um, I was reading some, this came up on the Twine um, uh, in some of the pull requests where one of the other maintainers suggested basically that you can do up at the top here, something like um, this, um, to avoid that start to, to avoid that startup cost, um, but I have also read um, the contrary to that that typing is is a no op at runtime um, by design. Um, so I need to, I, I apparently need to read up a little bit more on that. All right. Uh, thanks for thanks for uh, jumping on at the last minute. Uh, with no preparation and fielding all these thorny questions. Um, everyone, thank you for being here. Um, I'm hoping you got some ideas of things you'd like to talk about. Uh, I want to hear from you if you have ideas about how to improve events like this. Like I said, we're just making this up as we go along. Um, for instance, probably we could have asked questions verbally instead of in the chat. Um, and that might have been a little easier. Um, we don't have our project nights. I hear about experiments that other groups are doing for project night. Um, I don't know how successful they are. If you've been to one of those, New York City is doing project nights. I think there was someone in Boston who was doing something with Remo with the breakout rooms, um, which I haven't seen, so I don't know how well that works. But it would be great to get back to the more collaborative, interactive kinds of events like project nights. We're just not sure how to do it with 100 people online. Um, the Slack workspace has an organizing channel, which is great for discussing these sorts of logistics. Um, if you have materials that you want to post um, from this event, put them in the general channel. Matt, thank you for posting your events, but let's move them into the general channel. Um, I hope to see you in Slack. I, I love seeing the questions go by. I often don't answer the questions because either they're about data, so I have no idea what you're talking about, or I want to give other people a chance to get in there. I'm a little obsessive about being online all the time. So, you know, 
other people can have a chance at things too. Um, and that's it, you know, everyone stay safe, stay healthy. I'm looking forward to when I can leave my house and see you all again and eat, One day. eat bad pizza together. Um, let me know what you think. I'm, I'm open to ideas about how to do other things during this time. We've got lots of time on our hands. I mean, for instance, this is happening at 4 p.m. on a Saturday, which we never would have done as a face-to-face -face event. Um, but it worked out pretty well. So more ideas. I ideas are great. Send the ideas. Other than that, everyone stay well, stay friendly. And I'll see you next time. Take care. Thanks for organizing. Sure. Thanks for coming.